lost cities of the Sahara. How many we have seen while exploring the world's largest desert. We have left behind abandoned villages, ghost towns, frightened by their emptiness, by their silence. Sometimes we lingered, deceived by signs of life. In this case, a family of nomads that had ventured onto a set designed for other players. These towers will never again be manned by sentinels and warriors. It's been a long time since they were. In certain parts of the Sahara, even productive oases have been abandoned. Why? Why has everyone fled from here, even though there is still water? Abundant water at the bottom of the wed. Drinking water and water for crops. We filmed these scenes of desolation in the northwest Sahara, in the great canyon of Oued Murfes. The waters that flow down from the mountains that overlook the Wed vanish into nothing. Yesterday, there were rivers, where today there are only dried-out gullies cutting across the great wasteland of the Empire of the Sands. Only one waterway still flows through the southwest Sahara, the Niger River. The background for the third leg of our Trans-Saharan expedition. After crossing the Erg, the desert of sand dunes, we enter the Sahel, the steppe-like desert. We will travel over land and, whenever possible, by water. But first, we take a local flight in Mali that wings us towards the heart of the desert. The Niger is the only river in the world with two deltas. One is at its mouth on the Atlantic Ocean. The other lies midway along its course in the middle of the desert. And this is it. Channels and lakes closed in by sand dunes. The waters unite just as the sands divide. We are landing at Mopti. The city lies within the confines of the Sahara, but its inhabitants are to a large extent a mixture of ethnic groups from across the border in black Africa. They are known as the Fulbe peoples. In a Nigerian dialect, the word Fulbe means scattered. And indeed, the Fulbe are scattered throughout the immense Delta region. The best fishermen on the Niger are Fulbe of the Bozo ethnic group. Here they are at work during one of their communal fishing expeditions. In the dry season, when the Delta's waters are at their lowest level and canoes are impractical, butterfly-shaped nets are used for fishing.
On these occasions, too, even though the catch is never more than meager, the bozo work in groups. The modest resources of these waters are shared by the whole community. Waters, in this case, of a man-made canal dug 500 years ago to link the Niger River to Timbuktu. The most famous provincial capital in the south of the Empire of the Sands. Timbuktu was a crossroads, a starting out point and a destination for caravans carrying gold, slaves and salt. But above all, it was an important religious and cultural center of the world of Islam. More than 60,000 illuminated religious manuscripts were preserved in the city's mosque. Today, Timbuktu is semi-deserted. Only a few years ago, it boasted over 100,000 inhabitants, and the university mosque of Sankore, founded in 1500, was a proud reference point for them all. Now, the mosque is permanently closed. The emperor, Kankan Musa, used to pray here. He had the mosque built after his pilgrimage to Mecca in 1325. The first man from the Western Sahara to visit the holy city. A journey of over 1,800 miles by camel. The great mosque's illuminated manuscripts can be found in museums all over the world, those few that have survived. Vestiges of past glory, available to a group of scholars. paintings re-evoke another lost city, Kumbi Salen. These ruins are all that is left of a once thriving metropolis. Yes, these sun-scorched bricks and crumbling walls are the remains of Kumbi Salen, capital city of Ghana, a South Saharan kingdom that dominated this region for 500 years. Ghana had 20 kings before the coming of the prophet Muhammad. They bore the title Hayamaga, Lords of Gold, and indeed gold was the source of the country's power. It was shipped across the Sahara by caravan to markets as far away as Europe. Arab travelers were struck by Ghana's wealth and there are many reports of the country's mining industry. An Arab merchant in the 13th century wrote of having seen a letter of credit issued by his business contact in Kumbi Salen for the equivalent of 20,000 gold ducats. In 1300, the Arab geographer El Bekri wrote in his chronicles that the imperial treasury in Kumbi Salen held a gold nugget weighing 30 pounds. In those days, the capital of the Gold Kingdom had 12 mosques and 40,000 inhabitants. Today, a small, poverty-stricken community survives among the ruins in what used to be the mining area of the Kayamaga, the Gold Kings. There are no more 30-pound nuggets to be found, only traces of gold dust. Barely enough to repay hours of back-breaking work by providing the basic necessities of a meager existence that is totally in the hands of big city gold merchants. Hello. 
Everything is in a state of total abandon. The remains of imposing buildings are crumbling and fields patiently tilled for generations are turning to wasteland. One by one, the oases in the one-time kingdom of the Kayamaga are being abandoned to their own fate. In other regions, an international fund to save the Sahel has sponsored new palm groves in the hinterland around towns in the Niger River Basin. Wherever possible, machinery has made up for an absence of manpower. Wells are being dug in the desert. Water is being pumped to the surface. Water that is trucked to outlying villages. Communities stricken by a catastrophic drought that has lasted three decades. It seems absurd to speak of a water shortage in a country traversed by the complex network of a river like the Niger. The river rises in the luxuriant jungle of Guinea, flows out along the edge of the Sahara, and after a course of over 2,500 miles, meets the Atlantic Ocean. There are many busy towns along the river, vital links between the Arab Africa of the desert and black equatorial Africa. The Niger River Basin covers a staggering 2,100,000 square kilometers. And for the numerous trading towns in this vast area, the river is an essential line of communication. African marketplaces are a melting pot for a wide variety of ethnic groups. Meeting places for men and women. Trading points for every kind of merchandise. It is the markets that keep these river towns thriving. The major cities of the past are now too far from the river and its vitality and are doomed by their own isolation. Large towns like Jenné, where we put in, are dominated by mosques that make no secret of their origins. These enormous and yet well-proportioned buildings have mud walls, the most humble of materials for the most noble examples of sacred architecture to be found in Islam. Our driven canoe takes us back to Mopti. On the way, we cross paths with the largest canoe on the Niger. Powered by diesel engines, it carries 200 passengers at a time. The great mosque in Mopti is also made of mud. Modeled on the ancient mosque that dominates Jenné, this more recent building confirms the supremacy of Islam. Uh -huh. 
In spite of the size of the mosques, Islam had great difficulty establishing itself in this region. The people on the river have been Muslims for many centuries. But the same cannot be said for those who live in the interior, far from the Niger's banks. The pearl, this is one of their tribesmen at the market in Jene, and the Dogon live in far-flung villages in the mountainous provinces south of the river. Communities that are still animistic. In other words, they believe the forces of nature are the gods of the earth and the heavens. Animism is deeply rooted in this corner of Africa, and the imposing presence of mosques has not sufficed to wipe it out. The houses of Allah that are springing up like mushrooms rigidly reflect the mud construction and design of the mosques in Jene and Mopti, the model with which Islam made its first inroads south of the Niger. We move on again. Leaving the village of Medina Bangan behind us, our next stopover is in Tongo Romgo. The mud mosque here is considered a masterpiece of this unusual architectural style, so poor and yet at the same time so noble. But we have not come to this village only for more scenes of life in the southern Sahara. It is our intention to study and film daily activity on another channel of the Niger River. We are on the banks of the Bara Ise. Here, the traditional way of life of the Bozo fishermen is still very much in evidence. <laughs> The catch from collective fishing expeditions is usually better here than in other parts of the delta. The bozo supply large quantities of fish to markets on the river where it is smoked before it is sold. Smoking preserves this highly perishable commodity. It would otherwise spoil almost immediately under the scorching sub-Saharan sun. Inevitably, we find ourselves back in another market village in the Delta. From here, we will move on to another village where the Bozo fishermen, like fishermen the world over, are experts with large basket-like traps. Not only to capture the fish, but also to keep them alive in the water until it is time to take them to market. The community at work. Every man has a specific job, and the catch, either as food or as income, is shared equally by those we see at work here.
all the waters of the Saharan Delta of the Niger flow through barren desert. In the Isaberi area, the river is rich in aquatic flora, which renders the landscape less harsh. motorboat in which we are traveling upstream on the Bara Issei belongs to a relatively rich bozo fishing community. This is Niamfunke. The village is run on a matriarchal basis and that accounts for the community's unusual prosperity. The women have control of their men's fishing expeditions and manage the catch through a fish smoking monopoly. The abundance of straw and brush in the area when it is so rare elsewhere provides plenty of fuel for smoking large quantities of fish that are then sent off to markets all over the region. The women's ability and business sense have brought a prosperity to Niafunke that the village's poverty-stricken appearance belies. We say goodbye to the people of Isaberi, the Bozo fishermen and the enterprising women of Niafunke, and leave the magical world of the river behind. The long river leg of our Trans-Saharan expedition ends here. We are heading back to Mopti, from where we will set out again over land. But the Niger River Delta demands a parting glance a final glimpse of life as it is today. We should not be deceived by the deep flowing waters of those few secondary channels of the Niger that teem with fish. In actual fact, the great river's water level decreases with every passing year. The drought that afflicts West Africa is gradually drying up the delta. And inevitably, this is increasing the hardship of a people who had learned to live with the fragile but perfect harmony that existed between the desert and the river. That harmony is now lost. We wonder if it is lost forever. In the meantime, the passengers of these river boats that have run aground in the shallows between Mopti and Bamako wonder, more realistically, how long they will be stuck here. Weeks or months? Some have already decided to continue on foot, or as best they can. dawn of our last workday on the Niger. We fly over the inland delta to film a sparkling reflection that seems a mirage in the desert that surrounds the web-like maze of slow-moving water.
river journey ends, and we take up our overland route once again. Our destination lies along the next leg of our expedition, which will take us into the peripheral provinces of the Empire of the Sands, where magic still dominates man's daily routine. The land of the Dogon, astonishing survivors of an ancient African reality. Probably the most unusual environment of all those preserved beyond the South Saharan border in Mali. <laughs> 